Hello, everyone, and welcome to From Stage to Page. My name is Mahaid. I'm the stage manager for this event, and I'm pleased to welcome you to our 10th annual Wild Writers Literary Festival, which is brought to you by Wordsworth Books, the Balsidi School of International Affairs, and the New Quarterly Literary Magazine. Before we begin, I would like to extend our heartfelt thanks to our festival donors and sponsors, including the Ontario Arts Council, the NAP Wealth Management Team of RBC Dominion Securities, and the Audi Kitchener Water. And now I'm pleased to introduce our moderator for this event, Vin Nguyen. Vin is an educator and writer. His writing can be found in Brick, The Tub, The New Quarterly, and The Malahat Review. And now to begin our festival, I will turn things to Vin, who will introduce Nam, Victoria, and Wilfred. Hi everyone, um, good afternoon and uh, thank you for joining us. Um, I have the pleasure of introducing our writer for the session, uh, Nam. Nam, you can turn on your camera. Um, so Nam Nguyen is a Toronto-based playwright and lyricist of Vietnamese descent. His publisher forced him to write this bio less than a month after he graduated from the University of Toronto at a time when his only work of note was this one. Nam was named one of Now Magazine's Breakthrough Art, uh, Stage Artists of 2019, following the premier presentation of A, P a Perfect Bowl of, Bowl of Pho by Fujian Asian Canadian Theatre Company. His plays have been performed in theatres all across the TTC Streetcar Network. Um, so in addition to Nam, uh, we have two special guests joining us today for exclusive uh, performances. So uh, Victoria and Wilfred, you can also turn on your, on, on your cameras. Um, so uh, Victoria, Victoria, Victoria and I will uh, treat us to a rendition of Medium Flow later in this hour. So please make sure you stick around for that. Um, and also uh, Wilfred Moster and Nam will perform a scene called Peace Noodles for us as well. So um, basically what we have, uh, we have lots of treats this afternoon. Um, so Victoria is a recovering theater kid and currently a teacher candidate at York University, but will occasionally sing and perform when her friends ask her to. Wilford is a composer from, uh, for stage and screen from Toronto. When he and Nam first started working on A Perfect Bowl of Faux in 2016, he was studying ethics, society, and law at U of T. Now he's finishing his master's in film music composition at the University of North Carolina School of the Arts and having much more fun. So uh, thank you both Victoria and Wilfred for, for joining us and we'll look forward to hearing from you uh, very soon. So uh, but just a quick reminder that if you have any questions or comments for Nam, uh, that you can put them into the Q&A box that's now open uh, and we'll get to them during the Q&A period uh, at, the, at the end. Um, so Nam, um, you know that I'm a huge admirer of this play. Um, I first saw this play in 2019 at the Factory Theatre and really I couldn't stop talking about it. You know, I, I was really telling everyone to be like, hey, you have to go see this play. It's, 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 it's electric, it's full of life, it's, uh, it's so smart. And um, uh, yeah, I was just really super excited about it. And so I'm really happy to see that it's uh, now out in print. Although we, do we have physical copies yet? Uh, I don't know how many like exist in the world. Here's one of them. Uh, <laughs> right now, I'm just like uh, just getting uh, like the very small number of copies that I was given to like people who like directly helped me. Right. Uh, yeah. But, you yeah. Know, uh, but, you know, it, it exists in the world. Uh, I think like uh, the global supply chain that has uh, slowed down this process quite a bit uh, is uh, hopefully easing up so that the printer can get some get some damn paper. Yeah, so, totally. Ebooks are yeah. bad. <laughs> but they're available. Ebooks yes, are, e are available. So they are available before uh, 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 you know, before you get your hands on, on a print copy. And I get um, more of the ebook cut than the print one. <laughs> oh you do. Oh nice. <laughs> okay, so you should be you should be pushing the pushing that. So um, but yes, I'm 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 just really glad uh, that folks uh, will be able to um, see some of this work today and 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 to um, get to know you a bit more. Um, so just as a way to begin, could you just please tell us about A, a Perfect Bowl of Fall? Um, what is it about and what drove you to write it? Right. Uh, so basically, like, a, a, as a rough synopsis, there's like 12 scenes, like sketches or songs, which take place in like, uh, what, I, what I consider like checkpoints in uh, the history of Vietnamese food broadly, but more like especially pho. 
uh, and I say faux because I'm a colonized piece of shit, and so is everyone else here. It's okay. Uh, uh, so like it, it starts as like here's like a sad farmer his cow just got killed because some French guy wanted steak it's like the the beginning of uh, French colonialism in Vietnam and it's like oh what do I do now I, all I have left are these bones what am I gonna do uh, and then you know it hops around to different uh, points in uh, Faux's history uh, including like uh, the reason you know uh, that you know very regional ver various regional uh, variations of faux exist to like when uh, these restaurants started popping up around the world because of the the, the refugee crisis after the war uh, and so there's like that uh, part of it and then the other half of it is really just like in addition to that farmer at the beginning it's also like me getting berated by room my roommate kevin in first year just being like damn uh you haven't done anything all year in this first year and uh you're clearly like very sad and sitting in your room you need to go write something new and it's like what do i do and you know this 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 other uh strain of just like well you know you do what vietnamese people always do when we run out of options is uh we make pho in my case a perfect bowl of pho the play so like like part of the play is about the writing and the the, the, the writing the play and just like uh sort of negotiating just like what do i want to do with this scene <laughs> and so like uh so the, there's the, the central figure there of the character of nam who is just like uh thinking about what he wants this play to do and uh going along that trek as like it becomes like a slightly more successful piece of theater to the point where we're at the zoom call today yeah, that's that's a great distillation of, of of a play that I think is 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 really complex to kind of boil down, right? And I think that's something that you actually resist doing. And um, mm -hmm. I have a question about that later. Um, but I want to ask about this decision to write about pho, right, or write about pho, which is a this kind of touchstone, iconic Vietnamese dish, right? And that later late in the play, you bring up a lot of reservations about writing about food, right? right? So through this character of Nam, you let the audience know that there's an internal conflict with um, exploring ethnic identity through food, right? Which has become in somewhat a, in some ways a, a huge cliche, right? Mm -hmm. So I wonder if you could talk about uh, pho or pho and your choice to focus on food, right? It, Why was pho an important dish for you to center your work on? Uh, there's no need to uh, adjust however you personally pronounce pho <laughs> to accommodate my it's so, it's so yeah <laughs> it's weird to be like so you know uh, uh, yeah, and, uh, yeah. you know I guess like the, the my uh weird pronunciation of it is also like like it gets to just sort of like where it sits in my life where it's like okay so in the first scene we have this exchange between uh Kevin and I which is just like uh before I write I need an inspiration and we literally just list off the themes that I want to talk about in the show representation representation colonization gentrification orientalization something Asian and that literally was just what was going through my mind in first year when like Kevin just kept pestering me like hey write something and it's like I don't know what do I write about and I, I came across this article uh by uh this Vietnamese American chef Andrew Nguyen which is called the history of pho and strictly speaking none of the information in there was like new to me like I knew things in there about just like how uh, pho came to be in the first place and uh how uh you know, the, like even like the the peace noodles monologue that we'll we'll perform later, like that was like a thing mentioned in there. But I had already heard about that previously. Like it, you, that that's like publicly accessible information on like the Wikipedia page for Fo. But just like having it laid out, just like oh yes, there's something here. Like it, this congeals into like a sort of like a story that you know can be told over the course of like a couple of like uh, vignettes essentially. And so, you know, I was like, this will check off all my boxes uh, uh, as like a, a young, you know, 18 year old uh, kid who just like <laughs> really wants to write about these big important things. Uh, and then, you know, so that it, it just very much was convenient to hit upon like essentially uh, something that's very important to me is just like the history of the, the Vietnamese diaspora as we know it today. <clears throat> from like you know it faux exists because of french colonialism which is really just like east and southeast asian ingredients processed through like you know the birth of colonial capitalism uh through like the war being the reason why there's like a communist flavor of faux and a capitalist flavor of faux essentially and the capitalist flavor of faux is what gets dispersed out to the world when you know my parents generation comes here for the first time and you know why is there a faux restaurant so close to, you know, probably the vast majority of the people in the audience today? Uh, the reason is there is most likely because, you know, one, Canada became a multicultural country in the 70s officially as a policy. And two, that just so happens to be when all the refugees came over. And what do you do if you're an unskilled laborer in Canada and you don't want to work for a white person 
you open a restaurant or you open a nail salon. <laughs> so it's, it's so it, it very much just like was all the it, it's really just there for all the major historical points that um, essentially got the two of us here today. Uh, and uh, lest you think that's the end of history with just like, you know, immigrants arriving to Canada, and that's a happy ending, then social media starts existing. And now uh, every other week, uh, there's a new hipster fusion recipe, which starts a culture war on Twitter, which is, uh, yeah, so that's fun. It, it really just like hits on uh, just the whole trajectory of like how the, the modern Vietnamese diaspora uh, came to be. Uh, yeah, and it, it's like interesting in this way, where I was like, uh, I was born in the 90s and uh, this is like, like faux really becomes like this really hip trendy thing in like the mid 2010s. But prior to that point, I was just hanging out in middle school with all these Chinese and Korean kids. They all love to eat pho, but they don't pronounce pho correctly because they don't just like go ask their Vietnamese friend. And it's not like a commonly culturally accepted thing on Vogue to be like all pronunciations should be correct. And so they all had said pho. And I, I sort of like think of it as like existing in this broader like Pan-Asian Canadian cultural space that I also feel like is my heritage where you know we eat Viet food we all speak English we listen to Korean pop music we <laughs> we drink Taiwanese bubble tea and we watch Japanese cartoons so like that's why like I personally don't feel like such a, a strong attachment to the language as the defining thing of the uh of of my culture essentially yeah yeah no that's great and you know I mean it, it you know, the way in which you are trying to think about pho as, as this sort of touchstone, right, for, for Vietnamese history, right, as a way to really, as you're saying, right, you, you, you can really hit all of the points, all of the things that you're really interested in, 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 in doing through, through this one dish alone, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, what I really loved and appreciated so much about the play, you know, was that even as you're doing that, you kind of insert this kind of, you know, you call it a shallow medium at some point, right, mm -hmm. at one point in the play, you kind of go, oh shit, this is a shallow medium for me to kind of actually explore all of these things. Um, and then you kind of turn it back onto the audience, right? To ask them their investments and their attachments, right? And why, um, why they're here, right? And why, why does pho attract them to, some, to a play like this? You know, and so this, this brings me to this next question about this, the play's self-reflexivity, uh, self right? It's, mm -hmm. it's always reflecting on and aware of what it's trying to do. Um, and I really appreciate this and especially how it resists having a quote unquote point or a grand insight, right? Um, instead, the play really claims to be about having fun, about being funny, um, about making money. And of course, this, this last point is, uh, is, is, is an ironic point. So, um, <laughs> so what happens then is that this play, I think, doesn't have a point, but it, but it makes multiple points, right? It makes, it makes way too many points, you know, which is, which is amazing. It kind of throws all of them at us. Um, and it's, it's really so smart in the way that it deals with race, migration, diaspora, gender, family, cultural appropriation, the writing process, um, just to name a few of those issues. So was this always the approach um, that you wanted to take? And how do you think this sort of meta element, right? This quality of, of reflecting um, and, and, and laying all of your cards out for the audience. How has, how has that worked for you? Uh, there's like a sort of convenience to uh, meta narrative and just like, you know, having playwright as character and, you know, just being like, this is what I want to do with this scene and now we will do it. And then thank you. That was us doing the thing. Uh, it, 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 it's, it, it's like honest in a way, which is like, you know, uh, you know, keeping the, the contrivances up doesn't do where it's like, you know, this is not uh, a Wagnerian Gesamtkunstwerk, you are not like here to get totally sucked into uh, the drama of it. And I feel like that's more true to the experience of like uh, going to a play and you're like, let's just all recognize this for what it is. A bunch of, you know, university students have decided to, to put on costumes and uh, with just like the, the barest bones of, of, of budgets uh, to put together a show about soup. <laughs> it, 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 there's an inherent absurdity to that and now we will sing songs about soup it, it's really <laughs> please please pay, pay attention to it it's so important uh it, 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 there's an honesty there which is like true to the experience also just like going to a restaurant it's like you, you're not you don't go to a restaurant to disappear into food you go there to talk to other people and then comment oh this food is really nice and you know it, it, it's it, it the experience works on both fronts you know uh you have to have the unironic spectacle combined with like 
you know. And now we will talk about the thing we just saw. <laughs> uh, it, it, yeah, yeah, it, it's just a form of being honest. It's also just like what I found funny uh, from 2016 to still now. <laughs> Right, right. I mean, you. I mean, you. You downplay it, but hey, it's a bunch of university students putting on costumes, singing about a bowl of soup. Um, you know, has the potential, right, to 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 really be quite uh, radical and to and 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 to break a new ground and to do all the things that I think you actually do, right? Like, I think I think behind all of that, right, behind that spectacle, um, it's actually doing so much, even even when it's trying to tell us to think of it as a spectacle mm -hmm. right um, yeah there's an interesting thing about just like uh that relationship between the spectacle and then you know the bringing the awareness to it it's just like from the start it was just like very you know scatterbrained and i remember writing in my cover letter to like the victoria college drama society when they first like put out the the call to like have a play uh, mm -hmm. It's just like, I don't really know what this is about, but like, here's some important things we can talk about. And then later mm -hmm. on, the meta humor just became like an easy way to reflect on it, where it's just like, I'm aware that everyone in the audience is not like, uh, has, has not disappeared into the drama, which allows us to be honest. Uh, I don't just spend all my time thinking about Bo, really. Yeah. I spent the last five years thinking about this play. <laughs> so like, mm -hmm. let's, let's, let's just think about that in the open. Uh, because, you know, if, if, if Nam is a character, then Nam gets to just... Uh, talk about the play in like such a such a frank way <laughs> yeah it's an it's an invitation right and I think that's what makes it I think that's why you know when I saw it in 2019 I just I it, it felt so fresh to me you know um I think that's why it felt it felt um it felt it felt smart because it wasn't trying to make some kind of coherent narrative right like it wasn't trying it, it was it was being smart without trying to be smart and and I think I think that's you know one of the most beautiful things that a, that a piece of literature can do um, so, so I really love that about that. So thank you. Um, okay, you. let's let's move on to uh, a performance from the play, uh, to Peace Noodles. Um, so um, Nam, could you maybe set the scene up for us uh, and tell us sort of, uh, you know, what will we seeing? Yeah, uh, so basically the uh, the scene you're about to see is called uh, Peace Noodles. It's the sixth scene of 12 in, uh, in A Perfect Bowl of Faux. Uh, it, it, like, it, one thing that has stayed constant through like all the rewrites of this play is like uh, Peace Noodles is always the sixth scene of 12. It falls like right in the middle, right on the cusp of just like uh, after, and it takes place during the Vietnam War. It's a it's a it's a it's a waiter or waitress at, at a, like a faux restaurant in uh, in Saigon, like at the uh, just like the late 1960s, which is like a very pivotal moment in the war. Uh, and before this point, things are fairly like fun and games. Like here's a, a silly scene about like World Cultures Day. Here's my first date, which we'll see later. Uh, and then after this point, it's just like, well, now Vietnam is a unified country oh, when the communist side wins. And then also everyone else has just like been expunged out into the world, uh, which is just like, so it's a nice like dividing line at the midpoint, just be like, uh, after this, we will get to why FO is where it is now. And prior to this point, it's just like, uh, here's how FO like uh, tastes the way it does. Uh, but yeah, so this takes place just like in 1968, which we'll hear uh, about real quick. Uh, joining us will be uh, Wilfred playing the piano. Uh, in, in the actual show, it'd be like uh, the six-piece band. Here's a, like a piano production version of it. And uh, yeah, well, I think I think that's all the context that's necessary. Uh, yeah, and first of all, some troubleshooting stuff. I will need to share my screen because I am doing a whole bunch of weird music stuff. Is that okay? Yeah. Uh, make <laughs> please enjoy I, this picture of Logic Pro X on me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, hold on. I'll need the. Uh, I'll need to be enabled. There we go. Um, uh, let me just confirm. Oh. Actually, hold on. Okay, it's just a picture of the book. That Wait, I need to change my sound settings. If I had an actual keyboard, this would be a lot more helpful. It's under audio. Bam! Behind the scenes. All right, I'm going to mute myself and then just give me a thumbs up if you can hear me because there really... is no fourth wall. It's not real. <laughs> Hold on. Um, I'm going to mute myself. Give me a thumbs up if you can hear the piano. All right. Scene six, Peace Noodles. Uh, Subtitle, Spoilers, Communism Wins, kind of. Dark Music. 
Buck enters. Midnight, January 31st, 1968. Pho Binh, a tiny seven table restaurant in Saigon, the capital of South Vietnam. I work here. In the daytime, I feed American soldiers. Their embassy is nearby, they eat here often. I take their orders, it's a living. And at night, I feed other soldiers. My father-in-law came here from the north and set up shop 10 years ago when the French were evicted and Ho Chi Minh took power in Hanoi. Millions fled from the communists, mostly Catholics and business owners, people with something to lose. Pho wasn't big here until they brought their recipes south. Pho's changed here. Bean sprouts, basil, lime, poison. My father-in-law says you'd never see these in a northern restaurant. Pho is meant to be delicate pure. Garnishes are decadent. But the Southerners like their decadence. You'd expect that from capitalists. So we leave a plate of herbs on every table. Of course, Americans have no idea what to do with a bean sprout, so they don't touch them. And the soldiers I feed at night, the ones we hide upstairs, they don't touch them either. Time spent tearing basil is time you could be loading weapons or planning targets, freeing the nation. I do my part by ladling out their soup and keeping them from the eyes of the southern government. They'll do their part in one hour when they fire the first shots of the Tet Offensive. Happy New Year. From where I am, in 1968, I don't know yet that we lose this battle, but I am prepared for it. For death. I am prepared to die when, in three days, they discover the Viet Cong unit based above our restaurant. I am prepared to die when they arrest us, line us up, and execute two of my co-workers on the spot. I will wish that I died with my co-workers when the South Vietnamese army spares me just to torture me in a dark cage for years. But I won't die. I'll live long enough for our failed offensive to shake America's faith in its war. I'll live to see Nixon and Kissinger negotiate their exit. I'll live, and I'll see daylight again when we win and topple the Saigon regime, rename it Ho renaming it Ho Chi Minh City. I'll live and return to my restaurant. I'll live through our darkest and most impoverished years, through the reconstruction and US embargo. I'll live to see Ho Chi Minh's successors devise their great scheme to fix our country, capitalism run by the communists, which works somehow. And I'll live long enough for my sworn enemies, the Americans, to return to our country as tourists. They hear my pho shop has secrets, and they'll pay to learn them along with their overpriced soup. Imagine that, the waiter turned curator at the restaurant where we sell history, Pho Bin. It's a funny name. You can translate it as peace noodles. Bach waits, then exits. The music ends. Thank you, Will. Thank you both. That was um, that was absolutely beautiful. Um, I think I want to follow that reading or that performance up with a question about writing history. You know, mm -hmm. because um, this is uh, you know, this is in some ways based on a, an, an actually existing person, right? Yeah. A historical person. And so I, I want to ask you about your process, right? How do you, um, you know, how do you distill this history in a scene? You know, like that. I mean, this is one of the shortest scenes in 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 the book, um, and, and and you bring so much to it. And so I want to I want to hear more about your process. Like, how do you how do you do that? You know, what's what's um, right? What are your what are your techniques? What it, yeah. The interesting thing about this scene is that it's immediately followed by you know one with my dad who is like about as ardently anti communist as they come. <laughs> right. It's nice to just have these uh you know these two scenes right in the middle. Uh, mm -hmm. just like you know both of these people get to be the heroes of their own stories of course uh right. and and i think that's the essential thing it was like an interesting thing people uh in the food gen run saw the scene and like combined with like some of the projections like on the uh, on the back they came away with the conception that i myself was a communist <laughs> it's like it's not really a big deal whatever you think i am but it's like it, it uh, but it 
it was interesting to to just like mm. uh read like a couple of the characters politics onto my own when it's like uh, just trying to be as honest to i think what that person would feel as much as possible again this is a real person the, that restaurant is real and you know the the, the story is real and the, the Viet Cong unit was real and now it is actually a museum uh yeah it's it, it i think it really is just like <laughs> this is sort of like a hilarious perverse thing where it's like wilf had this thing where it's just like yeah i want it to sound like music you would hear at like a nice like military uh reception at like the washington monument or something for like this person who who, who like uh, just spends their whole life fighting america and, and mm. you know just like yeah you have to really just for each of these scenes usually there's just like one character that each of them is focused on and just like really much treating it as their story for for that time and you know the character of nam instead gets to be like a little more like uh fluid and just like just like sort of pop in and out and just like try to negotiate all their many viewpoints towards the end of the story but you know it, it, it's just taking them as seriously as they need to for for that scene and so that means just like they get to say you know mean things about america and then you know the next scene is just like and fuck the communists they ruined the <laughs> fucking country i hate these people right. so much <laughs> uh and it's also like why why the next scene immediately starts is why you have communists in your play why <laughs> awful <laughs> right. uh, uh yeah it, it just like yeah taking them seriously it, it, that, i feel like that's it uh yeah uh, it's also an interesting thing just because like uh you know especially these days toronto being like a major like uh, a major international city as torontonians love to say about themselves uh it it's like a very high population of international students and i got to and i get i got to interact with a lot of them throughout my undergrad and that's like a very different perspective than my own as someone who was raised in an anti-communist family and they're coming as you know newer immigrants uh and and uh international students and so it's just like oh that's just the the government you know that's okay we live with that it's chill and so you know i don't think they have like as strong feelings as the as the, as Bach, the character in that scene but it's like you know uh i think it, it, it's just like a different mode of, of vietnamese almost and you know to take that yeah at its word i think is very important uh and you know if if if, if there were if there were another uh like three scenes and probably get into like newer immigrants more, but you know, I, I right. stuck with the 12 right. I have. Right. Yeah. And it's, it's, and, and I think it's about historical nuance too. Right. Mm -hmm. um, um, you know, I think that's, that's, that's what you're trying to do. And, I, and, 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 you know, for me, it works. I, I, um, and, and Wilfred, that, that score is, is beautiful. <laughs> you know, I think, you know, when you get started, I was like, Oh, I'm getting emotional. <laughs> you know, um, uh, I was, I was definitely there. So, so thank you for that. Well, there's actually um, a great uh, footnote that is just like one of my favorite things that I noticed later on is just that uh, we wrote this music back in like December 2016, very rushed over the winter break to have like things for people to rehearse for like the next month before the, the, the play happened. But only like four years later did I tune into like the, so the major key section after like Buck McClary's I Will Live is just like do, do, do. It's like very, uh, uh, obviously like a very simple melody but it's actually if you know any old uh viet music it's the tuna <laughs> uh, is, uh yeah yeah uh, yeah which means spring has returned and it's like a very popular song for the new year which i like uh, like i really like how it's just like accidentally tied into like this nice theme of just like and it's such a joyful song right yeah. like it's yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. There's, there's an irony because you know that that song was written by a south vietnamese person who you know would not stand for have it be the anthem of a communist but you know right. it, it, it you know it's a nice thing to tie in just like uh spring has returned the new year mm -hmm. like brought about a, a sort of rebirth you know mm -hmm. I, I like that how that tied in entirely by accident another one is just like the, the pokemon theme is the ending of the first song <laughs> i'd like to think that was uh you know hundreds of years of history flowing through me as we as we wrote this in 2016. yes let the yeah. let the noodle of time flow through you <laughs> So speaking of 2016, uh, I want to go back in time, right? Um, yep. so you began writing this play when you were 18 or 19. How old uh, were you? So like, like the first like words to to pen probably would have been like I was 18. But I started writing writing it earn it like. So my birthday is like late August. The the first scene of Faux where I'm just talking to Kevin is like September 9th, 2016. But like okay. I would have already written like a few like ideas down before I turned nineteen. Yep. 
that's incredible because I don't think I was, I even knew how to like type when I was 18. So <laughs> like, I don't even like, like to be able to, 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 to begin to conceive of, of this play is uh, at that young of an age is, 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 is wonderful. And I want to talk about, I mean, it's, it's, it's been, you know, produced and it's been, you know, put on um, at a variety of different sort of shows, right? So, um, you know, Paprika Festival, Fujian, um, uh, Canadian Theater, Toronto Fringe, right? So it's 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 been it's 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 had its life um, in uh, multiple venues, um, and the print, of course, is coming out or it's already been out. Um, so could you talk a bit about this? You know, the the writing process, right? Particularly how the piece has developed and transformed through the years. And I also wanted to ask about the challenges or possibilities of writing something for the stage. Um, and then adapting it again uh, for the page, right? So, mm -hmm. so this kind of relationship between what's on the page and then you know what what we see on on on, on stage. All right. Uh, thesis statement: the biggest thing that changed from production to production to production to book is uh, the kind of inside jokes. Uh, <laughs> to take it through, like uh, from the beginning, it was like when I first handed it like something to show, like the Victoria College Drama Society. And, and they were like, yeah, this is uh, this will probably be something respectable by the end. Uh, it was like seven scenes, but only like half of each of them was complete. And most of those scenes are still in the, the final version, but like it, it, it was very like incomplete at the time. Uh, and really a lot of it was just shaped by, you know, who the team was at any given moment. Like, uh, like uh, the original person who played uh, there is this uh, sort of like pseudo spoken word piece, which isn't here and here now, but that was really just written because like uh, we wanted uh, to cast uh, this friend of ours, Vivian, who was just like, ah, she showed up with like this, this, this great rap. We need to do something with that, but we didn't cast her in any of the rap roles. Okay, we'll write a new one for her. And then, you know, uh, so that, 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 that scene only existed in there for so long because like the, the, the talent that showed up, right? And that was, that was also a bit of a surprising thing. It's just like, how do we find Asians to, in theater? This can be really hard. It turns out you just have to put up a poster in the chemistry building and that's how you get them. Uh, <laughs> uh, after that, it was like, after like we had our initial su success with just like all these like massive inside jokes for like the, the original student production, the, the adjudicator for that festival, David D, who also writes the, the foreword for the book is, uh, he, he was like very much like, okay, you got two ways to go about this. Either you like focus more on just like thinking about like, what food means to you when the writing of this thing and it becomes like a nice respectable play or you scrap all that stuff and it becomes like a really great friend show and uh being as indecisive as I am we just did both <laughs> and it's something I told him it's like it's nice to straddle this this these these three worlds of just like you know, there's like strong strong influence from this indie Asian theater world but also the, the Broadway musical as well as you know a sketch comedy and so uh you know, obviously, we having come up through the theater world, theater institutions have, you know, artsy director people who want to, uh, you know, uh, think hard about themes and stuff. And so that's where like the, the character of the very important playwright uh, pops up later, uh, like, in, in conversations with, you know, important artsy people like that, who are just like, uh, what's it about? And it's just, I don't know, I wasn't paying attention in second year university. This is all very cobbled together. Uh, and then, you know, during the Fujin, there was like, there was like one time where it's just like, uh, I don't like the scene, write a new scene. Okay, David. <laughs> we wrote this like very edgy thing, which I felt like uh, fit the, the Fujin aesthetic more about just like uh, this, this incident involving cannibalism in like, uh, in, in, during the refugee crisis, which, you know, uh, like I felt like slotted into their aesthetic more. And now there's like a sort of thing that scene that's taken its place, which sort of, uh, speaks to similar ideas, but, you know, more in my, you know, uh, voice, I guess. And, and yeah, now, like, now, like, the last thing we did was just, like, a 2020, like, uh, uh, video for, like, the, the, you know, the online version of uh, the Toronto Fringe because of, you know, gestures broadly. Uh, and, you know, we're trying to do it again for 2022, but, like, th there are more, you know, little skit-like scenes that, you know, popped up into the play as it exists now because, you know, that's, what I feel like uh, slots well into a fringe play, but it, it, it like, it's just like the accumulation and then eventually the shedding of like many of the scenes have just been like shaped by, you know, who was I writing for at any given time? What sort of audience was I anticipating? And like, uh, you know, it, it's, it, it's very much cobbled together from all those pieces, kind of like, you know, the soup that it writes about. So that's nice. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I guess that process sounds, you know, really organic, right? 
And I think there's something about, you know, or we, we tend to think of, you know, a published work as a kind of final, um, some kind of final mm-hmm. version of something, right? So I'm wondering, like, do you have plans to continue to write this? Like, do you have plans to change things to, 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 do, to do more with it? Uh, my hope is that I don't have to think about writing it for a while because I've been doing that for quite a while now. Mm. Uh, we'll see how I feel about it in like 20 years because I feel like that's just like a whole other like uh, <laughs> amount of life to live. Right, and, you know, right. It's like, you know, these, you know, the, the, the things said in here are very much things formulated by, you know, uh, basically a kid from like the ages of 18 to 23. You know, it, 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 I'm sure it was just like the benefit of like hindsight is be like, oh, here's the new thing that I didn't think about. And like, right. as, as, as I described, there's like so much change just in the five years that I was writing it. And I, and I changed a lot in that time as well. And what interested me changed, uh, like, uh, like, it's like a nice thing though, that it's just like food never stops being important in anyone's life. You know, mm. uh, if it's missing, you'll notice it immediately. Uh, it, it, it's, it's, it's something like I'd be happy to take a second look at once, you know, there's a different set of eyeballs in my head. <laughs> I would love to see that. I would love to see that. Yeah, um, too, okay, so <laughs> let's, uh, let's move on to uh, a performance from, from Victoria. So um, again, Nam, could you set this up a bit or? Um... Yeah, this is uh, scene five, medium foe, the one that directly precedes uh, the monologue. So it's, it's still like fairly lighthearted, but you know, it's uh, based on a true story. <laughs> uh, and we, we, I was hanging out with the, the girl that it's about just like a few days ago, actually. Uh, so I got to hand her like a copy of this book, which was nice just because uh, she helped me write it quite a bit uh, just by, you know, uh, when I was asking uh, people at the age of uh, 19, uh, it's just like, hey, do you have a faux story? And she was like, boy, do I have one for you? Uh, you just got to, to recount just like how uh, uh, that date had gone like like three years prior and it's really cool that we're still friends uh, yeah they basically i think it, i think the scene mostly speaks for itself and um yeah for, for so for context uh i am 15 she is 15 and uh this is how our date went uh the first thing that happens is just like uh my character goes just like oh cool uh are you hungry Okay, cool. Well, I think I'm going to have a fun. I am small. And that's like the cue for the song to start. Which will happen as soon as we fumble through tech again. Give me a thumbs up if you can hear the music, please. I found myself now at a crossroads that will determine how our day goes. I found myself now at an impasse. Now that he's ordered, I must choose fast. I have a full routine that I've perfected with my family, but I don't know if I can do the same in front of Nam. He might judge me if I show the hungry beast that's deep inside of me, but do I sacrifice my appetite just for propriety? Oh no, I don't know what to do if I should take a bet. Oh no, he's looking at me and I haven't ordered yet. I'm showing signs of hunger and I know he must be reading them, but why do you order small? I'm used to eating medium. Medium foe, I wanted medium foe. But this bastard must be on a diet or something. I can't explain why he eats basically nothing. Medium foe, God, I want medium foe. But the circumstance calls for an order of small, even if I think it's nothing at all. You never eat more than your date. That's just the way you play the game. When you're a girl in a world in which you can't look fat. Do I wait to see the weight he puts on weighing me? 
Will my medium give him insecurity about his size? Would I risk this date for that? Or do I do the faux routine that I've perfected with my family and show the person that I am while eating pho with Nam? He might respect my choices. He's a special kind of boy. He's affectionate and charming and so cute. Or he could be vain. And I should refrain. Eating more than a man's not endearing. So I've made up a planet adhering to conventional wisdom from a patriarchal system as decreed by the women proceeding that we need to be pleased with conceding. So we pluck and we paint and we shave off our corners. We nod and we smile and shrink our four orders. We stretch and we squeeze them down even though we'll be starving, sad, biking home in the snow. And we don't get annoyed while it's par for the course that the bar for the boys ain't so far from the floor. So why am I the one who has to put on a show? Cause this motherfucker doesn't eat a medium bow. And still no order at all. Hey, can you pass me the list? I'll have a faux duck yet small. Yes, I'll take a small, but I wanted me a small. But I ordered a small. There's nothing to say now, my choices are lasting. I have to hold fast to the fact that I'm fasting. Thank you, Victoria. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Victoria. That was amazing. Um, it's so it's so nice to actually hear it again. Um, and then you did a, a fantastic job. And and um, this is you know probably one of my favorite scenes from 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 the play. So um, I'm glad I'm glad you were uh, that you chose to uh, to perform it today. People often forget every song except this one. <laughs> yeah, it's a real crowd. It's a real crowd pleaser. <laughs> no, no, this is the last one. People like the last one as well. Uh, yeah, th these are the these are the th these two are just like the opiate of the masses, uh, and the rest are you know theory, <laughs> hard hard faux theory. Yeah, for sure. Um, okay, so I just want to make some space for uh, folks who have any sort of questions to ask Nam or Victoria or Wilfred um uh to do so i don't i don't see any questions right now but um uh again you're you you can definitely uh uh populate the q a with those questions if you if you want um but uh i can maybe do one more question uh, on my end um and i want to go back to this question um uh, or the character called the important the important playwright right yeah. Um, so this is the this is the person that stands in for the the gatekeepers, uh, the critics, uh, you know, the, the, those who are in positions of power, um, who attempt to shape the kinds of work uh, that gets produced and promoted, right? Sort of the uh, the ones who desire the respectable play that you're that you're talking about now. Um, so I love that in the play uh, you speak back to them, right? You kind of bring these critics into the play, um, uh, uh, and 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 I want to ask you about you know, um, how folks have responded to your work. Um, uh, what feedback have you heard? Uh, what praises or critiques? Mm. Uh, everyone's been nice all the time. Please buy my book. 
uh and you know yeah <laughs> it's uh i don't know it's it's been pretty like even-handed just like like very like people like it like it, it's made it this far for like a reason and there's like a nice uh reception i remember even going back to like uh the opening night of just like the not opening night is the wrong word i guess but just like our performance at the the drama festival just like uh coming up from the bow to see the the standing ovation there was like really just like a very formative moment in my life uh but it it, 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 it i don't know it's like it's interesting to have like this sort of like populist element to you know your work where it's like it's about a food everyone like this has only ever been performed in toronto and you know it's like everyone knows what foe is in toronto and they, they, they're all they're all big fans i've never heard of a foe hater uh and you know it's musical it, it was like a nice combination of like of a bunch of ingredients that are just like made to uh just like maximum enjoyment you should enjoy your time in the theater with us uh and so it's like interesting to have like more uh theoretically minded people come in and like uh approach it in their own way whereas like i remember like uh people you know one of them being like and this play is about how i'm secretly a communist was one of them uh but it, it's i don't know people approaching it very different ways because you know i feel like it, it's sort of necessary to how food is in general as everyone is coming with their own perspective in the same way that the play basically ends with the characters fighting over what it's about and you know that same response is true of people in real life <laughs> my mom like made a bunch of posts just being like this way is great wonderful story of just how the vietnamese diaspora came to be and you know built themselves up uh, from the ground after they had everything taken away from them uh and, and you know meanwhile you know we got all these artsy kids in toronto just being like you know secret communist and you know uh, we really got to problematize these things in the vietnamese diaspora and you know mm -hmm. and indeed asian theater has its own thing musical theater people have their own response to it and uh haven't heard much from the comedy people yet, but you know, uh, yeah, we're working on uh, we're working on all, we're working on all spheres. But yeah, it's it, it, it's it's it. I think that's just like necessity to just like such a, a broad. Uh, I mean, it is obviously very specific to just like uh, you know this particular food foe, but you know uh, everyone has divergent interests in it, and everyone thinks of themselves as the good guy in their story, and everyone thinks of the food they like as being their part as being you know their symbol and like the thing that you know makes them good and worthwhile i don't know mm -hmm. yeah yeah mm -hmm. everyone's coming with their their own different things uh i guess if you somehow walked in without knowing anything about vietnamese food it might be a bit disorienting but that's you know not a lot of those people in uh in the in the theater world these days <laughs> right 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 um so we have a question in the chat so nam what is your hope for the life of the printed publication of the play would you like to see people finding it and performing it at high schools, uh, for restaurants? Uh, for restaurants, uh, <laughs> like to, to perform it at a restaurant would be so interesting. Uh, and you know, there's like, there's like, uh, Viet people love karaoke, obviously. So some really old fashioned Viet restaurants still have like the, the place for the stage. It's just like, yes. And this is where open mic night happens as well. Uh, I, I would love to, to see it happen at a, a restaurant or a high school. I mean, I don't know how much uh, high schools can perform some of those swear words. I tried to cut down as we went along, but it's just like, we do uh, uh, curse uh, very often, uh, my characters, <laughs> especially me. Uh, I probably swore too many times in this call. So uh, it, I mean, it's just like, the, the yeah, to, to have it in a book form is really just to put it out to the world and, you know, uh, you know, all the directors in the past have just been like people I know like directly. And so it's just like, I'm really curious to see how like, you know, some random uh, high school director or like some, you know, university student in Waterloo say, or, you know, BC or, you know, America or, you know, anywhere else in the world <laughs> thinks about it. Cause you know, it feels very particular to my perspective and, you know, like it, it's, my presence was like very, uh, you know, uh, direct and just like, I'm able to talk to the director in that way. Uh, and, you know, once it's taken away from me, I would love to see what it becomes. It could probably be a lot more critical of the character of Nam. It's great. <laughs> yeah, uh, please take it away from my hands. Um, and speaking of, um, you know, where it's been performed, I know that you've taken this, um, I think it was, was it the Fringe Festival where you had to do a Zoom 
live performance of this. Um, you know, you had to orchestrate uh, uh, a kind of socially distant performance, right? So could you uh, talk about that experience, about sort of staging a play uh, via uh, Zoom or remotely? Yeah, uh, so what we did was in 2020 when uh, everyone was just like, theater won't don't shut down, I bet. And then, you know, it did anyway because the COVID doesn't give a fuck what you think. Uh, we, it, it, we just sort of transitioned from like our plan, which had been to like be at the 2020 Toronto Fringe Festival uh, to just be like, okay, let's make a, a video. Not the whole thing, just like, obviously it takes a lot more effort to make a, you know, 10 minutes of video than it does to make 10 minutes of theater. Uh, so we just put together just like the a uh, couple of scenes including you know medium pro which you saw you know, piece of noodles which you saw and like the first number from the musical uh, and you know some other monologues about vietnamese food interspersed in between and there's a nice thing that happened in that uh in that 2020 digital fringe was like one of the uh monologues from the second scene of the of the of the play which is just about like the creation of ben Jung. And so like, instead of, you know, the, there's like a mimed reenactment in the background as like uh, the character of Jen's mom tells that story. Uh, Victoria actually used to play Jen's mom, uh, tells that story. Uh, we had like these, um, you know, nice uh, still illustrations by my friend Hua Dang, who's like, a, who used to be the president of the University of Toronto Vietnamese Students Association. So that was like a great opportunity to collaborate with other uh, Viet artists who, you know, don't get to like be involved in a theater production otherwise, but you know, COVID forced our hand. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Uh, what else, what other components are there to, to making a digital theater experience? I try to stay away from digital theater as much as possible because I don't enjoy it. Um, Victoria or Wilfred, were you both involved in that at all? Or like, what was your experience doing that? Uh, I can start. I wasn't involved too much. The The score necessitated some editing just because, you know, I was growing as a musician. I was improving and saying, OK, this stuff needs to change or else it's not going to be good. Um, so I was doing a bit of editing. But most of the work, I think, was um, with the band and then Kevin Vuong, our music director. I mean, that was like the, the early days of the pandemic when like like John Krasinski had that good news show. Everyone was kind of coming together. We're all doing like board games and musical performances. Um, and so, yeah, we had the band record remotely. Um, we had like a sound editor mixer do it all together. Kevin was like conducting in front of his laptop to this awful mock-up that sounds nothing close to what we even had today. And uh, yeah, I mean, we just kind of cobbled together this, I mean, how long was it? Like 30 minute presentation. There was a few monologues, a couple songs, and it turned out so well. It was, it was really beautiful. And um, yeah, the, again, the band and music director will never ever get as much credit as they deserve to just in general in all of theater. And uh, it was totally, you know, Kevin and the band that made that work as well as it did, as, as, as well as the, the beautiful illustrations. Uh, Victoria wasn't involved in that particular production, but we have uh, done like a similar setup to this before uh, in just terms of like having her perform live. So I don't know if you want to talk about that experience at all of the Paprika thing. Oh yeah, I think it's just really strange because I, I I feel the same as Nam. Like I did have not done really a lot of theater in the past year just because I don't think digital theater is the same experience. But I'm also like doing schools as well, so it's not my <laughs> income. But um, yeah, it was really strange because in our own tech rehearsals, like because the three of us would cobble together our own little things. Like we had so many issues with like pacing and timing and just like internet lagging and the and obviously Wolf's music and score sounds so great, but you won't be able to hear like the little nuances in it because of the way Zoom compresses everything. And I feel really sad for them. <laughs> yeah, you really missed out audience. Come see us in 2022, it'll be real fun. Yeah, no, I really, I really hope that. Um, do you, do you have plans for a live performance at some point, or like, uh, is yeah. that, is that in the works? Yeah, we got our fingers crossed that uh, some like that COVID twenty one won't come into existence and uh, prevent right. us from like uh, doing the Fringe Festival, which we've been planning to do since like twenty nineteen, and now mm -hmm. like three, four years down the line, is like okay, uh, let's 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 try to make it happen now. Uh, but you know, we haven't put a lot of thought into that yet, so. We will see, but you know, uh, yeah. The, the interesting thing was like when when we were, the the process of creating the book was very much just like, okay, uh, let's have like a workable script that like like 
one the smallest possible cast could perform and two like a cast that isn't just entirely people i know <laughs> could perform uh and so like that the goal my personal goal is just like for fringe to be like the premier production of this particular iteration of this script right yeah so yeah I'm, uh... I'm oh sorry go ahead oh sorry i just wanted to add i think time has served us very well you know nam has not only grown as a writer but also finished the script i'm like in music school now um i know what i'm doing a little better and so this iteration of the score is going to be you know hopefully like the final version and the best version and then you know the, the the most it can possibly be so yeah 2022 is gonna be exciting awesome yeah i um i know that i will personally be looking forward to that um and and, and probably many of us in this room today will be will be um will be there as well so i really i i hope uh for for that as well uh, a live performance in uh, 2022 um so we are um, closing in on our on our time, I just want to thank uh, both Nam, Victoria, and Wilfred for 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 such an engaging engaging treat. Um, I loved the performances; they they were so beautiful. And uh, and and thank you, Nam, for sharing your insights with us. Um, so, thank you for having me. Thank you, Nam, Vin, Victoria, and Wilfred. It was such a beautiful performance, and I look forward to seeing the live one, hopefully in the near future. In closing, I want to remind our viewers that all our writers' books are available for purchase online from Wordsworth Books. Visit our online book table for a handy overview of all our festival <laughs> authors' books. Don't forget, the next Wild Writers Literary Festival event is Sidegeist Poetry, Writing That Speaks to the Moment, which is tomorrow, Monday, November 15 at 7 p.m. Thank you all for attending tonight's session. Go support a Vietnamese restaurant. And thanks for having us. Thank you. Bye.